Okay, hey everyone, looks like we are ready and we're going to be starting this fantastic event. Uh, we will be kicking it off with our wonderful uh, executive director, Dr. Marketa Huskova. Please take it away. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy and so pleased to, uh, to welcome all of you to our inaugural event, uh, Nurses in Media. And we are so happy to have you all here, and especially the panelists and all the wonderful, wonderful guests today. Um, with that, uh, that is the end of my speaking engagement today because we have fantastic experts here. So, Jared, please take it away. Thank you, everybody, and have a great time. Thank you, Marketa, so much. Uh, so brief. So uh, I will be your MC and your host for today. Uh, my name is Jared Fessler, and I'm the Communications and Programs Manager here at a, a California. Uh, I have the honor and privilege of speaking with our four uh, self-made nurses and media experts today, uh, and I couldn't be more excited. Uh, the first uh, panelist that we're going to be welcoming today is Ms. Alice Benjamin. Um, she is a board certified clinical nurse specialist and family nurse practitioner with over 23 years of nursing experience, uh, specializing in cardiovascular and critical care. Um, she is a recurring on, -air, on air health medical contributor for NBC4 Los Angeles uh, and has appeared as a regular for other local and national news networks, including the Dr. Oz Show, The Doctors, CNN, HLN, Fox News, TV One, <laughs> BBC, KTLA Morning News, and so many more. Um, so, uh, and, and she also hosts the weekly digital shows, The Exam Room with Nurse Alice, and Nurse News Now with Nurse Alice. So, uh, Nurse Alice, thank you so much for joining us. I know you had a quick video that you wanted to show um, the attendees today. So if you want to lead with that, then we'll get started yes. with questions. I will do that. Uh, here we go. Nurse Alice Benjamin is joining us. She's also known as America's favorite nurse. There's a lot of research out there that shows that in 28 days, you can break a habit or change your mindset. So if you make one small change over 28 days, it will become a part of your permanent healthy lifestyle. Our stethoscope, which I kind of have here, it's really important that we as healthcare professionals take the time to decontaminate these things because these should be considered an extension of our hands. We have to be careful because this will open the floodgates and open Pandora's box to designer babies. I mean, the next thing you know uh, with this technology, especially in the wrong scientist's hands, we'll be ordering our babies, right? Just like we go to the drive through and order what we want. He should be exercising and it's sad to see that he's given up on exercise because I bet you exercise and a little bit change in his diet would make a big difference from him. He'd probably sleep a lot better. He'd lose some weight. But what I really want viewers to know is don't throw your coffee cup away just yet because although there is some concern about acrylamide, which is the, the compound of concern, coffee itself does not cause the cancer. When it comes to pancreatic cancer, it's the fourth leading cause of cancer death. And stage four is basically the most advanced stage of cancer. Basically the stages go from zero to four. And when we progress higher in the number, that usually means that it's spread to the lymph nodes, it's spread into the bloodstream, and it's spread and invaded other organs of the body. So one thing is never put your whole turkey back in the refrigerator. You'll want to cut it up in small pieces and store it in shallow airtight containers. And if you do it that way, you can enjoy your turkey in the refrigerator for up to three to four days. Not only is the beet good at helping to bring your blood pressure down, this is nature's Viagra. Juicing is very important. You need about five to 10 uh, servings of fruits and vegetables every day. And right. we're not really taking that in. Who's really eating all that? Uh -uh. I think a lot of the public generally doesn't know what nurses do. I mean, we, we do more than blood pressures and give shots. Uh, we actually touch people's lives. Okay. And Alice, thank you so much for that, that introduction. <laughs> That's just absolutely wonderful. Uh, and I think it helps highlight a lot about what we're going to be talking about today. But before I get into these wonderful questions, which I've got up here on the screen in front of me that I want to make sure that we talk about today, uh, we do have a brief, uh, quick message. We've got our board president, uh, Dr. Anita Gerard here, and she just wanted to say something real quick uh, as we get into our presentation today. So uh, Anita, if you're still with us. Yeah. Uh, hi, Jared. Hi, hi, Nurse Alice. We're so thrilled hi. to have you here today. That's Thanks. so cool. This is such an important topic. Um, I am the president of ANA California, and my day job is the chief nursing officer and VP of nursing at Cedar Sinai here in LA County. And I have just recently, Alice, I just love seeing all the places you've been in the news because 
I've been hit up a lot lately to, as well to, you know, really have our voices be present in the in the news, in the written media, in texting and, you know, LinkedIn and all the social media channels. And so glad to see that, you know, you've, you've actually made it and you've done it and you can teach us how to be even better at it. So really thrilled to have you here today. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And, and what a great TF, because I really want to talk about your journey here today, Alice. Um, I, I think for a lot of nurses that are attending today, it's, it's an untold story. And it there needs to be more examples of nurses in media. So if, if you can take just a couple of moments to walk yourself mm -hmm. sort of uh, the why as well as the path to becoming a medical correspondent and contributor um, and, and, and what that looks like for you. Okay. So if you had asked me uh, 12, 13 years ago, if I saw myself on television, the answer would have been absolutely not. It's nothing that I necessarily sought out to do. It's something that naturally evolved. Um, you know, my, the reason why I became a nurse is because my dad suffered from several cardiac issues and that inspired me to become the best cardiac nurse in the world. He died of a massive heart attack. And I was destined uh, just really to get out there in the community and teach people about healthy living, um, exercising, diet, exercise, not to smoke. And my dad passed away at the time where statins were just coming out. I mean, cardiac caths are still very, very new. So if that gives you some time frame, but I wanted to educate. Um, and my mantra is I like to talk to people before they come my patients. So that's really what I was doing. I was doing what nurses do. We educate our patients and our families to make healthier choices so they can live healthier lives. And that's what I started to do. Um, and as a cardiac clinical nurse specialist, and with my why, I naturally partnered with the American Heart Association. So I would talk to churches, at schools, at different banks and jobs and community events. And, you know, this is when, you know, definitely way pre-COVID where we could do these things and do check blood pressures. And I just remember one day I was, you know, engaging with an, uh, a group of people and someone from the American Heart Association, their PR department said, hey, Alice, you know, you, the, you seem to get real, along with the people, you know, that's entertaining, they're engaged, you know. They're not running away. They're running to your booth. Um, would you mind, you know, c coming on KJL, going on KJLH radio to talk about how to be heart healthy during the holidays? Mm. I didn't have any training. Didn't know. I just thought, oh, patient education. Sure, I'll do it. <laughs> um, and I did it. And um, then they invited me to come back to talk about strokes and other heart condition, cardiovascular issues. And then the producers at the radio station, I, you know, I networked very well with them. The audience seemed to really enjoy the information. Because, you know, outside of getting information at your actual doctor's or nurse practitioner appointment, where else do you get health information? You're Googling, you're wanting this. And because I was already vetted with the American Heart Association, you know, everything was evidence-based. I'm an advanced practice nurse with all this experience. I was a very credible source. So they invited me to talk about other topics, uh, which was within my wheelhouse. And so I did. And then next thing you know, I'm doing more radio. And then other radio stations are asking me to come on and then I start, I start a blog and I'm just sharing information on the web. And then next thing I know, people are finding me on the web and saying, hey, we heard you on the radio. We saw you on, online. Could you come and talk to our audience about whatever health issue? And then it just kind of naturally evolved. And I, along the way, there were some definitely hard lessons, which is why trainings like this are so, so important. I'm a nurse first. I'm not a journalist. Mm -hmm. So I think that was very clear. I'd never said I'm a health journalist because a journalist who's passionate about health wouldn't call themselves a nurse or a doctor, even though they're, you know, um, well entrenched in the topic. So I also simultaneously started to take some communication courses uh, mm -hmm. so I could, you know, deliver my points, um, you know, uh, in a more, um, in a kind of punchy type of way, because you don't get a lot of time on television or radio. But I did some additional training at UCLA Extension in their communications course. I joined the Amer um, the Healthcare Journalists Association. I joined the Black uh, Black Journalists Association, and I started to learn the um, just like you go to a unit and you learn like where's the crash cart, where's the break room, who's the charge nurse, and you learn the dynamics and the culture. That's what I did with journalism, um, especially broadcast journalism. So I learned the ropes while maintaining my health expertise, and you know, learned to partner with them. But it's just a natural evolution, and then. I just, next thing you know, I'm doing television shows. Like, I just can't even believe it. Um, but I'll say this. Um, I thoroughly enjoy doing it. I love it. And fortunately, I have found this to be now kind of a subspecialty because fortunately, it's landed me in a 
reoccurring role as the medical contributor for NBC4 Los Angeles, which is the second largest market. So I'm just thoroughly proud to do this uh, and represent nurses both on television and then also in the social media space. Um, yeah, I, I, I thoroughly love it. <laughs> And, and you know, Alice, and, and that's fantastic. Thanks for giving uh, that breakdown of the journey for so many nurses, I think, here who may not know you as well as uh, Anna California does, uh, or, or even myself. You glossed over so many roles and extra positions and content that you produce. I mean, your Instagram account, uh, your podcasts and articles and, and chief nursing officer position at nurse.org, just on top of being this medical correspondent. So, um, you know, I think of a lot of what maybe gets lost and some of that is uh, what are some of the, and actually this is a question coming from Pam uh, from the audience. What are some of the prerequisites? And I know we we're kind of talking about this before the, the start of the event today, but a lot of people are wondering, what does it take for you to set up on yourself to even uh, look at an opportunity like trying to becoming a medical contributor? Because did you set up some of your social media beforehand? Did you create some of those relationships with other nursing industry news and outlets before going and speaking with individuals? Okay, that's a great question. And I'll <laughs> say this, I, when I started, Twitter was just starting, right? So for, <laughs> there was no Instagram at that time, guys, it was Twitter. Um, and I'll say, by the way, Twitter is the number one news, the number one social media outlet that news stations go to because they're looking for um, they're looking for text, sound bites, and links and things like that. You can't really do all of that on Instagram. So if you're looking to um, network with people, I would simply say I, I connected with I connected and followed with people on social media, um, especially at that time, Twitter. Um, and I was just sharing my voice. I was advocating for important issues that were out there, even when. I wasn't on someone else's platform. I was being vocal. I was letting my, you know, sharing the important messages that I thought that people needed to know. And, you know, producers and associate producers and talent bookers would find me on social media because I would share, uh, share these pieces. Now, if you're asking me how, like, how do I kind of, how do I get there, Alice? Literally, I don't know how I got there, but I'm going to turn around and look and I'm going to tell you my steps. But I literally was very engaging and active on social media, um, championing very important messages. And then once I took some social media courses uh, and I learned how to develop a pitch, a media pitch, uh, I would craft a pitch and I actually did. I sent out some cold emails. Um, I would, you know, I definitely would watch programs and find out where I, what was missing, what was, what, if there was a health message that was missing and try to insert myself, or if I saw a story and I don't feel like it was fully complete or there was something missing, I would email the producer and say, you know, great story. If you, you know, if you, if you would like, I'd like to offer this, you know, this angle of this story. And I would just, I would send them my pitch. Um, I, again, and then during the journalism courses, you, you know, there are other journalists in there. There are future newsroom directors, future producers, future anchors. And so you develop the network. So I'll be honest, I actually developed the network because at the time there, I didn't know any of any nurses that were doing this. So I had to build relationships with the producers and the, the people in the newsroom. Um, and quite honestly, I think a lot of them, I gravitated towards me because they couldn't find um, nurses and not even many doctors who wanted to do this because at that time it wasn't popular. It wasn't the thing to do. It was very. Uh, it was a road very less uh, not traveled, and so um, there were some hard times where, even though in my cardiac clinical specialty, I would be trumped by a physician to talk about heart attacks by someone who's an OB. Um, you know, so there are definitely some challenges along the way. But um, network, I would say, join the journalist associations, network with those folks, um, and then partner also with and speak with people who other nurses and doctors um, who are doing this type of work. Yeah. Those are such fantastic examples. And I love that you mention outside of the industry associations, partners and connections that help you get to a role or position that mm -hmm. might be like yours. Oh, and if I can say American Heart Association was instrumental in helping to um, provide me opportunities. So if you're within especially maybe your pediatrics, oncology, whatever your jam is, partner with your specialty organization, your community organization, um, and offer yourself as a health resource and say, you know what, I'd love to, you know, talk about, you know, 
uh, epilepsy and seizures and, or whatever the case may be, because many times they're, they're looking for experts. And then if you're right here, they don't know unless you, you offer yourself. And, you know, even other community organizations, American Cancer Society, I've worked with NAACP, the National Urban League, like it's endless, it's endless. Yeah. Absolutely. In fact, our 2022 Advocacy Institute fellow, Alicia Cantonese, um, through the fellowship got connected with the American Lung Association, and they ended up paying and having her go through a media training and then offered her more media opportunities on top of that. And I think now today she's involved in five different coalitions and thoroughly integrated into it. But I love that yeah. the American Heart Association was sort of that, that first step in getting you down this, this path. I'd love to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, to kind of switch modes uh, you know, from your journey, which I'm sure we could take the full 30 minutes on and keep talking about that, but I want to switch to sort of a skill building mode because I know that there's a lot of nurses out here that uh, if you say, you know, uh, speaking with a journalist or with media or getting on TV and your your heart starts to flutter and you get the butterflies in your stomach. So I, I think what would be great to uh, tell nurses about today is how you prepare for an interview. Because I know that there's been times where you get a call and you've got 30 minutes to talk about an issue. And then there's other times where you may have a few days to, to prepare. How do you approach both situations differently. And when they ask you about multiple subjects within the same segment, how do you manage uh, what you're going to talk about and say? I think one of my saving graces is that I'm an advanced practice nurse and have been in the profession for over 23 years because that's provided me so much opportunities, so, you know, anecdotal notes for days. I've read so many research articles. I've done so many lit reviews. So I'm, pr I'm pretty well versed. And if, if I was ever approached on a topic that I don't know anything about, I'm quite candid and honest. Like, you know what? That's not my wheelhouse, but let me find someone who is. Um, but I'll say, just having done this for a while, um, I've been able to talk about a lot of things. And, you know, when, when the pandemic started, no one was an expert. But somehow along the way, just being in it, talking about, um, you know, reviewing the studies, staying on top of uh, data that was coming in, I was able to comment on that story a lot. Um, so I'll say this, when it comes to being getting ready, how do I get prepared? Um, nursing experience and background is very important. Please always make sure that you, even in all my years of experience, I still benchmark practice. I still do a lit review to see what's the latest and greatest. There might be a new change that just happened two hours ago on the CDC, which is something we found a lot during the pandemic when I would come on. Um, and I would just make sure that I kind of develop some speaking points, maybe top five things that I think are most important about this particular topic that I want the audience to know, things that are going to be uh, practical for them, things that they, they can apply to their lives so they can live safer and healthier quality lives. Because um, the, the producers and the anchors and the people interviewing you may not know what the audience needs to know. They, they just know to ask you certain questions, but you're the expert. You're the health expert. You're the one who needs to guide this conversation to let them know what's needed. So oftentimes, I'd actually um, once I knew the topic, I would provide some questions. I would write some questions, say, hey, I, these are some questions I think the audience needs to know. Shoot them to the producer and the producer would work their magic and feed those to the uh, reporter who would then ask me questions. So it looks like they're asking the questions, but I gave them the question to ask me. So that's a little bit of TV magic. And then, you know, ideally it's great when you have 30 minutes to prepare or a, a day or two prepare. I'll be honest, in media, from what I do with, with news, I most of the time, like today, um, I'll get a call by noon about what we're going to talk about at four o'clock today. Mm -hmm. So that's often it. And during the pandemic, I was getting calls like, hey, Nurse Alice, are you available to talk about such and such? such a Yes. When? The, oh, the president has COVID. Like, can you come on now? Now? Like now? And so you, you also have to, if this is something you desire to do, you have to understand that, um, the timing of things is not always going to be ideal. So if it's something you really want to do, adjust finding a, a work schedule or a schedule that allows you to do this is something that you're also going to have to work uh, work through, uh, as well as making sure that your employer or whoever you know is on board with what you do, because this can be very demanding. Um, and because you are in the news, you have to be, media training is so important, so, so important, because the smallest misstep, the smallest switcheroo in a word can become a viral soundbite and not be at all what you intended. So, yeah. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think one thing that is clearly relevant in the in the reason why part of the reason why we're doing nurses in media day, right, is is to help show the background inner workings of how media opportunities are created and, and how we go about them. And there's a lot of transfer between advocacy and media. In fact, you need a lot of media to advocate, right? And so as a professional advocacy organization, ANA California has to also react to uh, on the minute demands or get journalists connected with experts like yourself mm -hmm. who are media trained. So developing a, a core group of nurses who have some sort of media training as well as our experts on multiple issues is something mm -hmm. that we try and manage as an organization internally. So um, the crossover between media and advocacy is, is just, it almost seems hand in hand in, in a lot of things yeah. that you're doing and, and speaking to in the media. And and so I think, again, that that is a great segue in how your choice of words when delivering your message and, and understanding who your audience is. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe talk about a little bit who the main audience is at NBC as compared to say nurse.org or some of your other media opportunities and how you frame your messaging to connect with the audience that you're ultimately trying to reach? Yes, it is so important that you know who your audience is. So um, I wear several hats. So as a medical contributor for NBC, um, my audience is just the general lay public. So it's not necessarily health experts, fellow nurses. You know, it's everyone from, I don't know, maybe the 13 year old kid who's sitting there watching news with his parents to, you know, our seniors who are 80 and 90 who are watching TV, just a wide variety of um, educational levels, income levels. So you have to keep in mind uh, when you're delivering a message that you have to, I'd make sure to always incorporate health literacy to make sure that it is simple enough um, to understand because we have to realize even within our own profession, these studies that we read are, can be very high level. We use big words. Our terminology is not, even amongst each other sounds very foreign. We use acronyms that we don't even know. We're all nurses, um, you know, depending on your specialty. So I make sure that I incorporate health literacy um, and depending on the topic, um, I may, the topic may be more focused towards a particular group of people. So it's being mindful of who the audience is uh, at NBC, being mindful of what the topic is and who the message is going to uh, perhaps be most impactful for. So for example, when we talked about uh, COVID vaccines and African-Americans and Hispanics disproportionately dying from COVID, you know, many of the messages I had to deliver really needed to focus in to empower and encourage them to, and to educate them about the vaccine. So you, it's really, there's not a one clear cut answer. It's like you're, just like nurses, we're multitasking, we're having to keep so many things in mind, your audience, the message that you're delivering, um, and then keeping health literacy in mind. So that's there. Now nurse.org, uh, as chief nursing officer at nurse.org, the audience is primarily pre-nursing, nursing, um, and then our our health our our um, our colleagues, maybe physicians, therapists, right. and people in the health profession. So that's very a different message. So what I will share and say on nurse.org may be delivered differently uh, at, at, with the message uh, on NBC. Would you say then that you would be more apt to use acronyms and more detailed information, for, say from like reports or, or statistics from research that you read as compared to NBC where you might try to make it as basic or, or as simple sounding as possible. That correct, that's what you're trying to commit? Um, well, yes, well, I just think you can have, the conversations can move a lot faster when using medical terminology with a health professional. Um, and then there are some aspects of healthcare that we as healthcare professionals look at differently because we know the inner workings mm. of things where the lay public may not understand, you know, what happens behind closed doors in the emergency room. So um, they're just different populations. Um, and But I will say this, regardless which audience I'm talking to, I think it's very important, even though I am um, licensed and credentialed, I always reference, you know, According to a study by the CDC, I think it's still very important to um, point to where the data is coming from so they just know that I'm not picking these out of out of the air because you only have so many minutes on television, three, four minutes to talk. Very often people will want to continue 
the researcher looking up information. So I want, I often guide them or direct them to a website or to talk to their healthcare provider <coughs> to continue the conversation. That's a fantastic point, and I love that. Um, so utilizing these last couple of minutes, I this might seem like an well, no, I don't think it's an, an odd question. I think it's more a complicated answer. Uh, and that is uh, you balance so many things in your, your week. I mean, again, being a medical professional, a media expert, chief nursing officer for nurse.org, Instagram influencer. I mean, you've just got a lot of things going on. So I know with millennials and Gen Zs super integrated into social media as part of our, our daily life now, how did you think about your social media presence as it relates to your media presence? And do you see the two as integrated? Do you see it as part of sort of the same journey and they're both beneficial to each other? How do you strategically visualize your social media versus your media presence? Um, I think you have to look at the outlet again. So for example, what I post on LinkedIn may be a little bit different than what I post on Instagram, maybe a little bit different than what I post on Twitter based on the audience. I know that Twitter is more so, on Twitter, I'm looking really more to engage with news outlets, other producers, kind of sound bites type of things. Um, the more social, personal personality me, piece of me because of pictures would be more Instagram. And then on LinkedIn, more of, you know, stories, um, I can, you know, add links. The same with Facebook. I know people are like, what's Facebook nowadays? But, you know, that you can have, you have to think about the, the, um, the attention span of the user on the outlet that you're using and who is, what are the demographics of that audience? So, um, it's, I like, I, I really, um, like to take a story and then look and tweak it a little bit differently for the different outlets based on who I believe, who the audience is on those outlets. Facebook, people are more likely to engage and write long comments and things like that. On Instagram, you're more likely to get an emoji or something like that. <laughs> Twitter, they'll respond to you. Um, but I think that's one of the keys. And I think that's what I, I would say has helped me to be successful and have longevity and have a reoccurring presence. Because it wasn't like a one, um, just a one time that I was on television. I've actually been invited to come back and reoccur. And I'm often working with producers on stories. And I think it's just be having my antennas up because it makes Nurses were the most trusted profession out there. People trust us, they wanna hear from us. And when I can speak in a very non-threatening language that empowers them and informs people, it, they lean in, they draw into it. And I think being able to have that and still insert a little bit of personality in there makes, um, makes the message a little more welcoming and inviting to them, and which I think is why I've been able to be invited back and over and over yeah. and over again. Absolutely. If, if I maybe rephrase it slightly a different way, just trying to, again, count for where people are jumping mm -hmm. off in their media journey. Do you see your social media as a branch to the your media tree? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's following me. Or, or vice versa. Is, is media a branch to your sort of social media tree, if, if that makes sense? Did you start with one versus the other? Well, um, I do, I probably do more, I do more television than I'll, I do social media. I'm, I'm literally almost on, almost every, almost every day. And so I, I will do a story on NBC, and then I'll go and do our Instagram live and people will come on and I'll elaborate on the topic. So that's how I like to use social media to have longer conversations, to be able to answer individual questions because on the television, I'm just, you know, it's just me and the reporter. I don't get to engage with the people like I do in social media, but they're, they're complimentary. I, I think you can't really have one without the other. Um, well, you, I mean, you can have social media, but I think, um, let's face it, uh, mainstream broadcast still is uh, very, um, very credible. People are not throwing away their TVs. Um, they're going to tune in. So I think it's important. I'm fortunate to be able to have both platforms and integrate social media to complement what I do on television. But I'll say this, for those of you who maybe want to get on television or aren't there yet, Please continue to create your own channel, create your own programming on social media. I promise you, I promise you producers and, you know, they're looking, they're searching the internet. They are searching the internet and it's great practice for when you actually get on mainstream uh, TV. Um, and so, um, yeah. 
Well, I've got three just quick uh, fire questions for you as okay. we get ready to welcome our uh, next guest. Um, one is from the audience here. Could you uh, please tell us again, what was the journalism association you became a member of? The American Healthcare, wait, American Association of Healthcare Journalists. Um, that put me in the room with all of the print, media, radio, producers, outlets, everyone who green lights those topics. And they're not nurses. Most of them aren't. Now we're getting seeing more nurse, nurses who are, who are writers or, or becoming journalists. But it put me in the room with them to kind of hear, what is it? What stories are you covering? Where are your needs? Where are your gaps? And then I would just kind of assess and, and look, say, oh, you know what? I can help you with this. And so it really is service. Nursing, we are you know, very service oriented. And I think what I do now is, is ser still service oriented. So I connected with them. I also connected with um, uh, the uh, National Association of Black Journalists. There's also the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. Um, but, and then also I went to UCLA's um, um, extension program and there are schools will have this where they'll have like a journalism certificate or you can take a class in broadcast journalism, um, a speech class, the art of the interview. I would definitely recommend anyone to, even if you just take one class to, if this is something you wanna do to help fine tune your delivery because you know, delivery is everything, um, unfortunately, unfortunately uh, in media, but I mean, you have the information, you have the knowledge, you have the passion, you care. So, you know, it's just another tool in your tool belt um, just like if you're working in ICU, you got to learn how to work all the different pieces of equipment, how to hang the A line, yep. how to do the C CRT, you know, so it's just another tool that you can add to your toolkit. So I would suggest that people join those associations. Um, also, you know, advocacy, like you said, is very important. So joining the American Nurses Association, actually attending the Advocacy Institute, which I did, um, mm -hmm. is also going to be very important. Um, and your community organizations, every opportunity you can to champion a message, I would say, go for it. Love it. Thank you so much, Nurse Alice, for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Bye. Take care. So it looks like uh, just like being a nurse, I'm not a nurse, but just like being a nurse, you know, you got to roll with the punches. So I think we're going to go ahead uh, because of those technical difficulties and move on to Dr. Ali Taib. Um, he was going to be our fourth uh, presenter in the lineup, but um, uh, we'll be able to get Ali queued up here. And I'm very much looking forward to this conversation too. I thought it was going to be the perfect sort of wrap up, but uh, you know, Ali, you get to sit on the other side of that table here for once um, and be the person that gets questions answered. Uh, or, or you get the answer to the questions, I should say. So Ali, how are you doing? Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Of course. Well, let me give a, a brief background um, before we get hopping into some of these questions, because uh, I think you have just a fantastic background. You're doing a lot of things that I think uh, hopefully we can touch upon uh, today. Um, so, you know, Dr. Ali Taib is a United States Navy veteran. He's a registered nurse, educator, artist, and creator. Uh, he is also the host of the RN Mentor uh, podcast. Um, he is currently an assistant professor at the California State University in Los Angeles, and his work and research concentrates around improving access to care and benefits for veterans and advancing social networks to connect and advance nursing issues while facilitating nursing discourse centered around the theory of social contracts. All right, there's so much that we're going to have to break down in that uh, <laughs> introduction, which I'm sure we'll have plenty of time to do so. Um, but, you know, as I did with Nurse Alice, just leading up to this, I think one of the most important things for nurses seeing, you know, self-made nurses and media experts is to learn a little bit more about that story. Again, the why and sort of the pathway leading to your spot now as, as, as host of this very large RN Mentor podcast. So if you don't mind, Ali, please. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for having me. First of all, uh, I, and you know, um, I, I love the lineup of the of the panel. Um, so everybody's so different and in in our own kind of niche areas. Um, the RN Mentor podcast and my kind of step into so I don't want to 
I have a hard time calling it media, but I guess it is media. Uh, but you know, having having this platform to actually share information really started out uh, sort of accidentally. Uh, pandemic happened, and one of my assignments in one of my courses was to reach out to nurses who are, you know, uh, pretty high up on the on the food chain, and you know, just so they can look at their CVs to look at pathways, right? How did the nurse get from point A, where they were in school and getting their associates or bachelor's degree or whatever, to where they are now, where they are now uh, chief nurse executives or presidents of nursing organizations. They're at the top of the uh, field for research. Uh, so those are the things that, you know, uh, um, kind of, uh, I was having my students look, and when the pandemic happened, a lot of people kind of went underground, emails weren't being answered. Um, and as I was trying to figure out, I said, I was thinking about, oh, I could record a couple of people I know, and I'll share that with my class. And I'm going to blame my wife for this, but she said, why don't you do a podcast? I'm like, oh, hey, I've been thinking about a podcast. What a great opportunity. And luckily for me, everybody was at home with more time on their hands, right? Uh, so that's how the podcast actually came. It came strictly as a way for me to share information with my class. And uh, I think the first time, I, I, I think the first couple of episodes that went out, it was really just my class that was listening. So I had about 60 or 70 listeners and you know, after the end of the first season, I started creeping into the into a couple of thousand people. I'm like, wow, this is more than I thought. And you know, to circle back. Now we're in season five of the podcast, and uh, we're forty thousand listeners in sixty five different countries across the across the world. So it's kind of blown up, and 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 it's 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 exciting. It was accidental, but it's exciting that it's happened. Uh, it just it just means you know. Um, there was a need for it, right? Uh, there's a need for the information. There was a need to hear from these people, from the people that I bring onto the show. And I think that's how it happened. So um, something I was using in the class, something that I sort of had a need for myself, but um, that's how it came to be. Well, you know, before jumping into the gigantic juicy list of uh, guests that you have on, uh, if you haven't seen uh, or been to uh, Dr. Taib's website, our mentor podcast, please do so and check out some of the big names that he has uh, on his podcast. I, I, I want to dive in. You kind of mentioned, it's so funny, uh, the personal life choices that sometimes influence our, our business life choices. And, oh, hey, let's just do a podcast. And, and that's how I got started. But perhaps could you uh, maybe shine a little bit of light to sort of the business case for doing a podcast yeah i think that's uh, interesting and, and worth discussing yeah definitely uh i i hadn't even you know i wasn't even a big podcast listener when this thought kind of came to me I, I i occasionally dropped in on a podcast that i thought it was interesting i had a, i have a couple of colleagues that also have their own podcast platforms that i that i that i listened in once in a while but it wasn't till I tried to get into it where I realized that there, there's there's some barriers to like moving forward. Like you know, even even like what do you name it, right? Like what mm -hmm. name isn't being used because there's literally thousands and thousands of podcasts out there. Like what do you name it that like a like a name that isn't uh, that isn't taken? I think I went through three or four revisions before I found one that wasn't uh, you know that. And then you had to you had to think about. Um, what platform are you going to put it on? Uh, and I just happened to have created my own website, putting some of my own stuff. Uh, and I said, okay, well, I can just add the RN Mentor po Podcast onto that site because the podcast is self-funded. Uh, I'm not associated with any organization. This or my podcast isn't associated with any organization. I don't. Uh, there's no monetary compensation for me to do this. It didn't start out that way. And because I do use it for my coursework. Uh, I have my own issues with conflict of interest, right? So I make sure that the information that my, I share with my students isn't like somehow monetized for my on my end, which there's nothing nothing wrong with that, but you know, just my own my own uh, kind of how my own brain works, right? Um, so. And then you have to think about like, what equipment do I need? Uh, how am I going to get on different podcast platforms? What kind of marketing tools am I going to use? Uh, what's the cost going to be, right? So all of, the, all of this stuff had to kind of go into it. Um, like, how do I edit? How do I, you know, how do I get the, you know, luckily, and I've gone through like probably four or five different platforms of recording different 
apps and and programs of recording um so a lot of lot of uh information that was available on how to create a podcast but until you get into it and do it and mine's a solo so i'm like the creator host producer tech advisor book you know people you know, I book my own shows. I edit, and all it's all me. So, uh, so it does. It, it does take a little bit of time. It, it reminds me of a, a commercial where a guy has his uh, very young business, and he picks up the phone and says, "Oh, you, IT problem? Okay, let me transfer you." And then picks up the phone again in a different voice. Exactly. See, see that. That's me. That's hundred percent uh, me. That's true. You know, this is this is a perfect chance to ask you because uh, this is something that I want to ask all the other guests, but especially having a, an audio or a podcast, the editing and, and taking the time to do that with Alice and with James and, and with Dan, they've got you know social media and editing their own videos and, and stuff like that. Could you talk about how you manage that workload because it almost seems like a separate part of the business that you almost forget about until after the episode and you're like oh <laughs> now i need to go back and, and almost double the work re-listen to it over and over again so how do you fit that into managing podcasting um sort of what what is your approach to editing yeah uh, and, I, and I'm sure the other panelists or, or the other uh, guests that's, that are going to be on here are going to kind of agree with this. The editing piece really takes, I've seen, I've seen all the social media platforms that the other guests have, and uh, they're definitely more in tune with social media than I am. Uh, I use social media more of a way of saying, hey, here's my show, it's out there, more of an information uh, and a link to my site or a link to one of the platforms that the podcast uh, plays in. Um, I'm I'm horrible at recording myself uh, and sounding like sound to try to sound exciting. Uh, I, I I know James put one out for uh, 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 for for this morning's uh, you know, A and A California Nurses and Media Day, and I was like, yes, I'm going to share that with everybody because I could never put something something like that out. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I'm horrible about recording myself. So, uh, you know, so I primarily use, uh, uh, face, Facebook hesitantly, uh, but Insta Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn to just put the information out there. Uh, but when you look at back at editing, like for my podcast, uh, one of the things that I, uh, really didn't account for when I first started into it is the amount of hours that goes into, from the time you start even looking for guests and booking to the time that you actually record. The recording itself for me on average is around 50, 55 minutes right. um, because my shows are about an hour long. Um, and when you go back to edit, uh, you probably go through editing two or three times. So by the time you're finished with, with my editing edit, anyway, uh, you're looking at probably about anywhere between four and five hours of editing time um till it's ready to publish um plus you have to you know uh, like i put it on uh, you have to think about like i put it on youtube but it's just the audio it's not the video that's one of the things i tell all my guests i'm not going to put you i don't want people like you know get all dressed up even though sometimes they do and i see them they get all dressed up for this and, and at the end of the day i'm like oh yeah i'm not i'm not recording video <laughs> this is just for us so we can talk but and then you have other guests who show up in their pajamas and i'm perfectly okay with that because uh, it's just an audio piece. It's it's uh, so so yeah. You're looking at about four or five hours from podcast perspective. I know with if some of the social and then to get stuff out into social media that takes a little bit of other. You have to create some social media content, uh, which I I'm fairly simple on that. I just put out the uh, like the couple of pieces I I create for each of my guests. I'll probably take uh, take me about. 20, 30 minutes to do, and then just being on social media consistently. And I think everybody will agree with me is consistency in what you produce is one of the key factors in getting and getting your audience and growing your audience. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, uh, I, the reason why I bring up this editing, again, mainly because it's sort of the unthought about part of being in, in media is editing. And whether it's podcasting or social media or writing articles, you're going to have to have some sort of editing process. Um, and, and because a lot of nurses are who have been reaching out to us have been thinking about, hey, I want to start a podcast and asking this question or this question, but they already have a full-time job. 
Yeah. How do you then layer in this extra work um, and, and make sure that you can produce something that you're really wanting? So that's it, very insightful um, to, to mention it that way. Yeah, and I think it's important to understand, uh, like like everybody else, we, we don't produce content just to produce content. Uh, there's a certain amount of passion that goes behind it uh, and a desire to do this kind of work. Otherwise, if it's if it really is work for you, it, it may come across that it's work for you. Uh, so uh, like I said, uh, from, from me anyway, it's not monetized uh, and, and it's, it's a work of the heart, so to say, because I'm passionate about my own background with uh, professional development and um, all of that. It kind of comes from that arena um, to develop these, these shows. Absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. And Alice said basically the exact same thing. It's got to come with that core belief first. Otherwise it will just be work at the end of the day. Yeah. Correct. So, you know, now kind of switching in and, 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 and talking about those deep connections that you've built, you've built some pretty impressive relationships over the course <laughs> of, of your, your podcast. And, and I just started clicking through the pages of guests that you uh, had on your website. And A, I needed to look some of these people up because I, I said, okay, if they're on Dr. Ali Talib's uh, podcast, I really should probably know who they are and what are they doing in the nursing space. Um, but I guess what the most impressive part is, is how you've built these relationships to generate additional opportunities, whether that's media opportunities, advocacy or work, um, you know, speakers for just other, your, your classroom, whatever it is. So I guess the question I'm wanting to, or wanting to ask you is, how did you think about creating your guest list? Um, who, because you only have so many slots in a season, who do you think about inviting? Do you sort of create a theme? I mean, we already have our mentor as the theme, right? But sort of what's your approach to inviting those guests and, and, and what are the additional things beyond just having them as a guest that you may consider? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, creating a list uh, isn't too hard. Uh, it's, uh, and I always tell people, it's my show. And I talk to people I want to talk to. <laughs> so uh, the podcast really serves as a conduit for me to reach out and say, hey, can we talk for an hour? Right. Uh, I mean, if, if I didn't have the podcast, I would probably be some creepy guy calling, say, hey, can we talk for an hour to people I don't necessarily know? Uh, but, you know, with the podcast, I can say, hey, I have a podcast. Can we talk? Uh, and the show is about you. Uh, and it's really people I want to talk to. I mean, that's the reality of the show. And I wish I had more. Uh, I wish I had more opportunities to talk to more people. Uh, but just because I do have a full-time job and I have a family and uh, my show only goes out, uh, I have, um, I do about 20, like 22 to 25 shows a year. So about two seasons a year uh, is what I've been shooting for. Uh, and it's every other week during the season, just because, you know, it's, it does take time uh, out of my, out of my life. And I have to, you know, uh, be realistic about, you know, producing. I wish there was more time because there's a lot more people I want to talk to. Um, but uh, from a, uh, from a list perspective, like I said, just people I want to talk to. And I do go after some of the heavy hitters in the world of nursing uh, because they are at the peak of the profession. And a lot of times we listen, we hear the, these individuals, like if I went to a conference and, uh, you know, uh, like I, the, actually the show that just came out today, uh, Dr. Shannon Zink, uh, she is the director of National Institute of Nursing Research, right? Uh, government job right under NIH, uh, pretty, pretty, uh, um, important role in the world of nursing, right? Uh, uh, but if I went, if I was at a conference and I heard her talk, at a, at a, at like a, if she had a podium and I heard her talk, I would say, uh, I would probably be hearing about some new research study or something that was NINR specific, some new initiative. I would never know how she started out her nursing career and how she got to that podium. And I think that's what the podcast really does is show that pathway of how do you start in the world of nursing or how was their start in the world of nursing and how she got to that podium because she started out as a first gen 
a college student. Mm -hmm. She went, she wasn't even a, a nursing major. She was a French and German linguistics major. Uh, went over to the world of nursing because she had that drive and, and, and passion for it. Uh, her mom actually pushed her a little bit that way. Uh, she found, she was, a, she started out as a med surge nurse because I know a lot of new grads are like, oh no, I don't want to go to med surge. I'm like, med surge is foundational. Yeah. Like you can start wherever you want. I have no objections to that. But she started as a med surge nurse, went into another, you know, guru in, uh, in, a, in the nurse, nursing profession, saw a need, she saw a passion for research, went that route, found some mentors along the way. And, you know, opportunity after opportunity opened up for her as she grew in the profession. And now she's leading nursing. She's the lead for where money goes for nursing research. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I think it's important that we see those pathways and those journeys because otherwise we never hear about them. And that's one reason, again, I've started the podcast is we don't, uh, a lot of the things we hear out there, uh, we don't, uh, we don't get to listen to that journey piece. And I think that's where the podcast speaks to a lot of people. And that's been my biggest surprise because I always know what people are doing now. I don't know how they got there. And that's the piece I'm always curious about. Uh, so um, that's... Well I have to be honest then, Ali, is I, I took that journey portion directly from your podcast, and that's why we're doing the journey portion today and the nurses and media. It is directly from you. That's why you got to look at the people and, and what they're doing is right. It, it spoke to me so directly because um, when you look at people with certain titles, uh, you naturally think, oh, this person is some big mucky muck and, you know, doesn't have time and, you know, is never, they don't have a, you know, a, a story I could relate to, but more yeah. often than not, especially as you see on your podcast. They yeah, I mean, every, they all, you. they all started, they started out as, as, uh, you know, CNAs, they started out as associate degree nurses, they started out uh, not even in the nursing field, never even thought about nursing until they found themselves looking for another opportunity because whatever they had gotten into didn't work out for them. Um, and, you know, um, it's, again, it's, it's, it's that journey piece that we, that we don't hear about. Like I see, you know, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop some names now. Uh, like, <laughs> uh, like uh, uh, for example, Dr. Grant was one of the, uh, president of the ANA was one of my first guests on the show. And I said, hmm, who can I have? And, you know, like some of the stuff that I that I never knew about him, I knew of him, I knew what he was doing with the ANA, but I didn't know how he got to that role or how or what he had done. And those are the things that you never, um, again, hear about. And I purposefully try to diversify my guests because my students are, are a diverse population. I want to make sure that they see themselves in nursing. Uh, so I purposefully look for, uh, nurses uh, of diverse backgrounds and diverse experiences, um, because I think that's important. Uh, too, we see too much of the, of 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 the, you know, what we consider. As soon as you say nurse, they think, you know, a lot of times we think, uh, you know, white female, you know, white clothing. You know, that's kind of what everybody's sort of the Florence Nightingale every image that pops into everybody's brain. But nursing isn't. We're still majority like that, but we're not all like that. And I think it's important that we diversify what, and we show people that nursing is more than the Florence Nightingale model that's been handed down for over a hundred years. And I think you do that fantastically well. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I think the uh, last couple of minutes that we've got here, a couple uh, quick fire questions uh, to, to pick your brain. Actually, this one is coming uh, from the uh, audience. And it is about if you're starting as a beginner podcaster or just starting maybe perhaps a new podcast, do you suggest that you start as a self-speaker or do you conduct interviews? Um, from, a, from, from my own experience, I would say, so there are some really great podcasts that are really just host-centered uh, where you have one individual that talks about various uh, topics because they are... They have expertise in that area. Um, for example, one of one examples I'm going to throw out is like the Nurse Keith show, which has been around for a long time. Uh, Keith actually does uh, both. He does some some of the stuff that he does is just him. Sometimes he has guests on. Uh, I think if you're going to start out a podcast or you're thinking about doing a podcast, I would start by listening to other podcasts. So you're not 
but you need to find where your creative, where your where your passion is, and also try to find out what's not out there, right? Because if something already exists, it already has built an audience, you're going to try to tap into somebody else's um, uh, sort of arena or, or something they've already built a, mar a, a brand around. So it's going to be harder to establish yourself. So I would look at where there's still a lot of gaps in nursing podcasts. So I would look at where there's gaps in information or need. Uh, and then I would try to build a brand around that because I think that's one of the key things. Uh, I, I've seen, uh, if you know, uh, I've seen the, sh the shows in different ways. I've seen host-centered. I've seen me. I, I'm really not big about talking by myself yeah. and then recording it and, and sharing it. Uh, I'm horrible at it. Um, so I always need somebody to, to you know, like, I need you. I need, I need you across from me so I can talk. Um, so that's why I don't do that. I always, and my show's not about me. It's about my guests. Uh, but you know, sometimes I do ask questions that I want to know because again, my show, uh, but, but that's the thing that, but I, uh, I always, it's, a, it's about the, the guest journey, right? It's not about my journey, but it's about the guest journey. Uh, and it's, so they are the topic for that show. Um, and I've also seen, uh, if that is still, if you're like still a little bit hesitant, maybe you want to look at a co-host because a co-host always adds that additional, um, um, uh, voice and perspective, and it makes it, it makes it, it makes it a bit richer. Um, and as, as, you know, uh, as I'm thinking, I'm actually not, uh, I was trying to do it last season. Uh, I may do it this coming fall where I'm going to bring a couple of my previous guests on as co-host to co-host with me, uh, on a, on, on a, on a couple of the pieces, uh, because like I said, uh, there's a lot of, lot of knowledge and information and perspectives out there. Uh, so I think, um, kind of, shake things up a bit it doesn't sound like you have to stick in one lane or or the other you've got some flexibility as well oh yeah yeah you can you can always do special you know one of the things that i'm looking at doing now are some special topic shows because some people reach out and say hey can you talk about this i'm like it's not in the theme of the podcast but i think it's an important topic to talk about uh, so is there an opportunity to do a special show just on that uh, and that's one of the things i was trying to do last fall and it didn't kind of work out but hopefully this fall we'll have some um some of those special topic shows absolutely well last question for you before we bring on our our, our next guest if you had a person or another nurse in media that you follow who who are you already following or who should other people follow um uh, I, you know, I, 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 I don't like to make that, those recommendations. Like, again, um, look at, I, I would follow everybody because there's just so much information out there, um, that, uh, but if I could make a recommendation, it would be look at the nurses that are making impact in the profession. Does that make sense? Uh, I will look at who is making change through their platform, who is who is redesigning the profession of nursing through their platform. Uh, that's what I would say uh, I would look at uh, as far as uh, media goes or, or, or podcast goes or social media goes, because there's a lot of people in social media. Uh, so there's a lot of nurses in the social media um, and some of them are influencers. Uh, not everybody, but not just because they're an influencer in the world of nursing, it is, you need to look at the impact, right, uh, of their influence. Is their influence making positive change in the community, within the profession, on a national level, on an international level? I would always say, look at the impact, uh, look at their impact. Uh, and followers are one thing, you know, just having a lot of followers. Like, you know, um, I don't have that many followers on like Instagram and things like that, but I have a lot of followers on Twitter. Twitter, I, I heard Nurse Alice uh, speak to the Twitter piece. Yeah. Twitter is a more, uh, for me, a better networking arena. Uh, and you get a lot more engagement off of Twitter from, from nurses who are looking to, um, who are more engaged in the profession of nursing. Uh, Instagram tends to be more of a social 
component, but there's opportunities for networking in Instagram or LinkedIn and those kinds of places as well. Um, so just, just to be politically correct, I won't call out any uh, specific uh, nurses that you should follow, but there's a lot out there. And I would, again, look at the impact that they're making. Because again, what, 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 my, what my personal choice would be for you to follow uh, may not necessarily be uh, your choice or may not speak to you. I should say. I, I love how you rephrase that. Dr. <laughs> Thank you so much. Who's making an impact? Because really that is the, the difference at the end of the day. Well, you know, that 30 minutes went by far too fast. We'll have to have you back another time. Dr. Taya, thank you so much for your time today. Really thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Take care. Uh, so now we're going to be inviting on Dr. Dan uh, Weberg. Um, this is, uh, I mean, I just, I'm in love with all of the panelists that we've uh, got today, and I've had the pleasure of speaking with uh, Dr. Dan many times before this, so it uh, should be another great conversation. So, uh, Dan, welcome first. Let me give you your, your due diligence and your introduction here. Um, so, you know, other than being an expert in, in nursing and media, Dan is also an expert in healthcare innovation and human-centered patient design with extensive clinical expertise in emergency departments in acute care uh, patient hospital settings and academia. Uh, he is currently ser uh, serving as Vice President for Transformation Services at Ascension, uh, supporting 60,000 nurses, uh, uh, 140 facilities, and moderni modernizing nursing technology, developing new care models, and measuring uh, innovation outcomes. Uh, he was also the previously uh, the head of clinical innovation for Trusted Health, a staffing platform for the healthcare industry, where he helps drive product strategy and works for the change, the conversation around innovation and healthcare workers. Whew. Now that we got that all the way, Dan, um, because that's just really the tip of the iceberg, I think, is uh, everything that you have your hands in. Um, I love or I'm very much looking forward to this conversation because it takes a little bit more of the lens and view of an organization or association. Obviously, that's where I reside in and try and work on media opportunities for ANA California. So I think this is a nice uh, change of pace from, let's say, uh, the other three guests that uh, or panels that we're having today. So. Uh, Dan, as I've been doing with the, the other panelists, I want to talk a little bit about your journey, um, a little bit of the why, but the path towards um, getting to a position where you were making strategic decisions about sort of, you know, media from an organization perspective. Yeah, um, well, first, thanks, Jared, and uh, thanks, ANA California, for having me. I'm excited to talk about this. I think, you know, we, we can do more to have nurses as media resources in all sorts of formats, from podcasts to, you know, national media spots. So um, I think this is a great, a great forum. You know, my journey in media sort of started, um, well, it, it sort of started when I was at Kaiser Permanente, um, where, you know, my role there as director of nursing innovation was really kind of an internal external facing uh, kind of liaison for nursing to technology as well as uh, as well as some strategy stuff. And so I got the opportunity to really um, start speaking all over the country um, uh, on stage as well as with different um, different outlets, media, podcasts, all kinds of different things, and that kind of got me um, kind of primed for for media training and all the things that you kind of learn about how to deal with reporters and questions and uh, deflect and and reframe into your your kind of message and all that. And then really at Trusted Health is when it kind of took on a whole life of its own. Um, you know, number one, it was uh, a staffing platform <laughs> for travel nurses, which uh, was is a very hot topic. Is and um, it was during a pandemic. And so we got a lot of opportunity to talk to reporters. I think we did oh, uh, probably a couple dozen uh, different media media uh, interviews, everything from local newspapers and, and two second spots on, uh, on the local news channel to uh, NBC Nightly News and talking with uh, Gabe Gutierrez as one of their correspondents in the field. Uh, and so that really just opened my eyes to the opportunity. And I, I struggled at the beginning. I, I remember some of the first ones and really just, you know, it, it was just not great the way I, I took the questions and, and answered them maybe too honestly sometimes. 
and uh, without really having that kind of message I was trying to get across. And then now, you know, being a part of Ascension, um, it's a whole different game where, you know, anytime someone reaches out and we're doing this with a podcast host at the moment, you know, the entire marketing and communication teams needs to vet it before I'm allowed to go on it. So, you know, it, it's just different flavors at different organizations. And, uh, and, and I've learned a lot and, and, and gotten more comfortable in that space now. And I'm excited every time I get the opportunity to now jump on and, and talk about, you know, and, and further the message for both nursing innovation and just representing nursing as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, the complete opposite of what uh, Dr. Tyre was just talking about. My my podcast, I'm going to get to do what I want. There's a little other few considerations uh, that come in when it's it's part of an organization. Um, you know, it, well, Dan, you couldn't be more right about the opportunities because of the pandemic or just a, a crisis type situation where they're looking to nursing voices in particular on all of these different topics. And there's a breadth of things, again, from innovation all the way through to, you know, hospital settings and what's happening. So I, I think this would be perhaps a great time um, to talk about sort of what was the, as the pandemic happened, and I think that's a great maybe sort of starting point because it's different than a long-term potential uh, media strategy, but what was the strategy that you decided and, and sort of came up with as the pandemic started to figure out, okay, how do we sort of get the most bang for our buck? And, you know, making sure that we are staying true to what we're working on, but making sure we can tackle as many opportunities as, as possible as well. Could you speak just a little bit to sort of the boardroom feel, I guess is what I'm kind of getting uh -huh. at? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, for sure. So we had two two kind of outlets for information, uh, and most of this happened at Trusted Health in the in the last two years. Um, uh, and so our platform was, you know, a nurse first support, you know, digital online home for nurses in order to support them in their journey um, as as a, a kind of a flexible worker uh, as the pandemic moved, and uh, and really and really supporting them from a mental health standpoint as well, and sort of representing the profession as much as we could because we were getting a lot of inbound media inquiries. And so in the boardroom, it, it was interesting. Early on, um, we we were very picky about who we wanted to talk to, depending on what the angle the, the reporter was taking. If they were going after, you know, the, the cost of care and those type of things, we kind of shied away from that early on, um, just because we didn't really have our talking points together. We were a startup. We were entering in a space with the majority of the company not being clinical. And so uh, we had to kind of find our footing on and what what we were going to what we were going to message, not not to not to shift it in any devious way, but just to have consistent talking points so we didn't get all over the place and really kind of just be confusing or, or send a message that wasn't meant. And so, but, but through the middle of the pandemic and then, you know, kind of later stages of it, we, we really focused in on taking any media inquiry and just using it to, to have a platform. Because by then we had set up mental health support for nurses. We had partnered with Ohio State University in order to set up a crisis and coaching line for, for over 100,000 nurses across the country. So we, we changed the platform from answering questions about cost of travel nurses and the shortage and how nurses are moving about and, and kind of the impact of, of COVID just in general to Yes, that, that's all important stuff, but there's a platform here for us to have an opportunity to change healthcare and support our clinicians. And when we started talking about that and really diving in, we did a, we did a study where we had some uh, key data points and recommendations that we could share. When we got those talking points really nailed down, then, then, it, then it was easy because it, it came from the heart. We had our talking points. We had solutions to some of the, the media um, buzz that they didn't may not have understood from a, from a lay people standpoint. And we really were able to shift the conversation towards supporting the, the clinical workforce rather than kind of being a recipient and just answering these kind of quick fire questions. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, especially in regards to the pandemic, I think a lot of the focus was just on problems. Mm -hmm. um, it was problem, problem, problem. What's the data? What's people speaking about the problem? And there, it was it was a needed shift to try and make sure to change people to start focusing on the solution. Sure, here's the problem, but then what are nurses doing to try and address that issue and and making sure that part of the story is 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 told. Um, so you know, you kind of touched upon the next question and sort of what considerations you had and, and before you took on media opportunities or in developing your media strategy. Some of them were, you know, 
we got to make sure we know what we're talking about with talking points and feel like we're okay, not just surface level, but that we could actually talk about these issues. Um, another uh, part piece of it that you mentioned was about making sure you had some sort of value or something that you could link back to that would further solidify credi you know, credible uh, uh, expert on this topic. What, do you have other considerations that you maybe you could list there, again, that were maybe discussed in, in how and what media opportunities we want to engage in. Yeah, I mean, we, we sort of said any media is good media at one point um, because it gave us an opportunity to kind of continue the, the platform of supporting healthcare workers, which for me was, was a personal mission and, um, and, and I was really willing to talk to, to really anyone about it. We, we would do a fair amount of due diligence. We, have, um, we had a PR lead that would, um, would help kind of talk with the reporters and get a, get kind of uncovered their angle so we could be prepared for kind of questions we have um, we had a, we actually have had a media document that was really great it was um, uh, expected questions kind of curveballs and we had kind of talking points because in the moment you're talking about something you're really passionate about and it's easy to just go down the rabbit hole and be like well you know and go kind of go off on your own opinion and stuff and so we really tried to stick to the talking points and even if a curveball came in we had ways to kind of turn it back to our message and, and to acknowledge the question and then say, but, you know, yes, the, the, you know, X, Y, Z is happening and this is an opportunity for us to do this thing as well. And so really hitting down on usually two or three key messages for any engagement we had. Um, but there, there was no, uh, there, there was no filtering at the end. We were just kind of, uh, you know, it, it, local, national, uh, you know, frustrated with nursing, didn't understand the problem. It was all an opportunity for us to reframe the conversation. And you know, what drove a lot of it was we were seeing these articles come out where some of our peers or competitors um, were were kind of not as um, uh, their message wasn't as clear as it could be, and so we wanted the opportunity to be able to to change that. And you know, the, even even now, you know, I, I saw the sixty minutes interview with, you know, around the staffing crisis. And at the end of that interview, they interviewed three chief medical officers about the nursing shortage. And nothing could frustrate me more than having people that aren't directly dealing with and managing that problem like where's the chief nurse and those type of things and so we really wanted to take the opportunity to put the nursing voice on things where hospital executives were were weighing in uh staffing agencies were weighing in the public was weighing in frontline nurses were weighing in but we, but we wanted to provide that system view and and the opportunity to shift it towards what can we do about it rather than just uh, a lot of the sort of um rhetoric that was kind of spinning at the moment yeah absolutely so, you know, it, you bring up so many great and valid points because there's so many considerations, not just from an organizational standpoint, but then the messaging standpoint, and then how will it be received? And then what, you know, pipeline or which audience are we, uh, our media outlet, are we going to potentially be going through? So it, it's, it's very, there's a lot of steps, it sounds like, in, in getting ready to launch as an organization to go say, okay, we're ready for media opportunities in this topic. And then let alone X, Y, Z and other hundred topics, and especially for advocacy organizations, which I felt like Trusted Health was a, a, a true advocate for nurses and developing so many of those resources, mental health, et cetera. Um, so I, I just think that this is such an important piece of the conversation in, in people understanding the context of which media opportunities are created. Yeah, and Jared, Jared, on yeah. that, I mean, every single media outlet has an agenda, right? They have, they, you know, even if it's just investigative reporting, they, they have some assumption that they're trying to research and get data on. And so you just have to understand that. I mean, we did a lot with Business Insider. Their audience is, you know, people funding companies. And so you have to know what their, what each one of these media outlets angles are. Um, and even in some cases, their political standings and other things, because that's where those questions are going to come from. And in some cases, they'll try and change the que the line of questioning to get you to speak to the agenda that they want. And so you just have to be aware of those things in order to navigate those harder questions a little bit more. So, yeah, well, I guess maybe that brings up a question because this is definitely something that Alice and, and Ali talked about, which was making sure your words, because that one word could change the, the perception of your, your message. Was this 
as an organization, did you write this media strategy down or this was something that you all just continued to check in on, touch base with, where are we going, sort of a, a, you know, from the huddle type thing? Yeah, we have a, we had a contracted PR expert um, that I worked really closely with. She was non-healthcare, so I, you know I, I kind of played the clinical expert. She played the how to navigate the reporters expert, and together we partnered to get most of this done. She was really great in prep documents and things, and I would tell her my opinion. I would I would answer her questions and say like, we don't want to touch that one. <laughs> we do not want to be near that question, or you know how do we how do we take it and move it because it's just gonna it's gonna lead to the, these other things that you know we're we're just gonna get backed into a corner on that that's not gonna be helpful for the conversation and so we really partnered just her and I on on most of it um and 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 so that was the media side and then you know we also had the podcast side and the podcast up and really drop the conversation you know that's where we could have our agenda and, and kind of line of questioning to get the message out but we we had a strategy to do both yeah yeah well, thanks for segueing that so well for me, Dan, because my next question was going to be about the podcast. <laughs> it's like maybe you do or something. Uh, so, <laughs> so, and I think this is this is interesting for people to know because the the conversation we've been talking about is very organizational association approach. But here you are hosting a podcast under sort of, I guess you might call an umbrella of this organization. Now, since having, you know, moved on to a different position now at Ascension versus Trusted Health, but you're still able to use this podcast sort of form that you host in MC to create additional media opportunities. So I guess, you know, there's a lot of different questions in this realm, but I think more from the personal angle, how did you sort of come up with the idea uh, for this podcast, pitch it to sort of this broader, you know, board of people. And then the third question being, how do you sort of see the life of that moving forward? Yeah. You know, it was really the idea of the CEO at, 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 uh, when I joined Trusted, um, but but it was never about marketing a company. It was all about um, an opportunity to have a conversation about what's needed in healthcare. And that that's why I signed on. Orig originally, I did, I had no desire to host a podcast. Um, I, I, I really resisted it. It's the complete and, opposite now. Yeah, though. <laughs> that's like the complete opposite now. Yeah. Uh, I had no desire. And season one was rough. I remember the first couple interviews. I was nervous. I, I had my like $400 mic. I was bumping into it. Like I created my own like intro music and stuff. And it, it, it you know, it got through and, and we got through it and, and, and it was fine. And then by season two, it just became old hat. Like, you know, it just, it just got really well. And we did, we started doing prep interviews um, with the guests before we had them on live, which helped kind of navigate the couple key talking points for a 30 minute conversation. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we ended up hiring a, a sound engineer to help with the editing to really make it sound very professional. And, um, and, and so it, it kind of evolved. And, and now I think we have over 60,000 downloads last time I checked of, of about four or five, se four seasons of, of the handoff podcast. And we're talking about it, the next season because it's not, you know, it's not a marketing vehicle. It really is, a, you know, just a, a platform for us to interview really interesting healthcare leaders about topics that I think are important to the profession. Um, you know, we we may be we may be launching another season soon. So um, it, it, I I got I grew to love the podcast and and honestly to meet um, some of the coolest healthcare leaders in the country and just have thirty minutes to talk about whatever I wanted with them was was fun. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think um, maybe with something that people might be interested in knowing then is where how, this is very similar to the question I was asking uh, Dr. Tabe, which is using or, or having the podcast be a vehicle for creating additional relationships and how do you sort of see it beyond just the podcast, right? Because you, you're creating this content and you have your mission and vision, which you just, just stated again, but there's always these other considerations that you're thinking about. So could you just talk a little bit about your own process when you think about um, inviting guests on, how do you create your list? And then sort of what are, additional things are you looking at? Yeah, we usually pick a theme for the season. Um, we, we, what we've done is we'll do about, I think we do about 
10 to 12 episodes all around a, a kind of a loose theme, whether it's, you know, mental health and wellness for one season or sort of innovation technology stuff. Um, we, that that kind of guided how we engaged with the different um, the different speakers and sought them out. We we did get some inbound people asking to be on the show once we had a couple seasons out, and we would think about you know we would really assess it, does this person meet with the message that we're we're trying to put out this season, and then we'll take three or four months off in between seasons to really kind of refresh, see what the latest trends are, and then come back out. So we kind of have this chunked out uh, uh, release uh, release format. And, um, and yeah, it, it, that, that tend to work out really great. Um, I, you know, I don't think I could do like a weekly one where, it, you know, every single week I'm having another person on. Um, and, and so I liked bulking the interviews together and then releasing them over kind of a 12 week, three month span. Uh, that, that really worked for my schedule. Um, and, you know, the podcast is I've used it a ton. I use it with my students at Ohio State uh, as an opportunity for them to hear some of these conversations. Uh, at Ascension, we were just talking about a couple things that I had interviewed people they wanted to talk about about the same topic. So I shared the podcast interview with them and they're like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what we wanted to know about. And so it's become a resource for other avenues. Um, and then, you know, it's also, it's also a, a, a place to have content for, you know, where I, you know, I love LinkedIn. I, I've, <laughs> that's, that's kind of my platform. Uh, I enjoy the most and it's been a place to engage in conversation on LinkedIn too. People can listen to the, the content and then we can have a discussion on, on social media about what we talked about. So it's really got a life of its own and has been used in multiple spaces. Even, you know, we're releasing another book um, uh, for, for leadership in, for the, for the undergraduate and are into BSN cohorts that are coming out, um, that's coming out in a couple of weeks. And we're using, you know, some of the content linked back to the book content too. So it's really just, it's an ecosystem of a message and content that has a life of its own now. Yeah, I especially love the medium of podcasting. Maybe it's, I feel like it's easier to transmit uh, uh, information in a, in a consumable way. Um, it, but it, it's interesting to see the different, complete different perspectives all these, you know, are in mentor podcasts versus this organization, you know, trusted health podcasts and, and the processes for getting guests, but also how you actually set up the season of, of, of guests to, to be joining on. So mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see. I, I, we might have Marquetta, hopefully Dr. Marquetta Husko on that next season of the podcast. I'm very much looking forward to it. It's, um, uh, it, it, it's great that you are able to apply different themes to to stay topical, and I guess that is the what I'm trying to convey to the audience mm -hmm. is, is sort of your your themed podcast or having a podcast in which you can introduce different themes to make sure that it's relevant to um, the overarching mission. Yeah, uh, you need so a, you need a connector, honestly. Like you need you need a high level theme, even if even if you don't want to, you know, have a an individual theme for a season. You know, the RN Mentor podcast ha has a theme of, of mentorship and leadership and, and developing, right? And uh, we have our, our individual themes for the for the different seasons. Others have, you know, the the Gritty Nurse podcast, kind of the real life of a nurse kind of things. And so you it, it, you got to have that story to tie people in and bring them into your podcast. If you if you just kind of interview a lot of people and there's no there's no sort of story behind it, uh, I think that's that's where it, it it may struggle a little bit. Uh, you know, Dr. Taib talked about, <clears throat> uh, you know, what is most important for the podcast, and that is making sure the the impact or the the value, the message that is being said um, through the podcast. Uh, so, I, from Trusted Health's perspective, how did you come up with these themes uh, for the podcast? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was it was really just thinking and, and looking at what's happening in in the nursing profession that we needed to address that others weren't. Um, similar to what was stated before, it's where's the gap, and we would find gap in you know the the tough conversations about you know what what does this mental health crisis look like? What does a shortage look like? Trying to dig into that. What are some of the politics and legislation that's passing that we you know we talked with Marquetta about that as well in one of the episodes. You know, what are the, some of these driving factors that, you know, that just aren't talked about and sort of being a, a little bit of the provocateur on some of these things um, and then using the, the guest platform to inform some of these, these conversations. That's really what's, what's driven most of it. Yeah, love it. Well, Dan, last question for you uh, and, and to try and rephrase this after asking Dr. Ali Taibe is 
what nurse do you look for or look to, or, you know, perhaps there's nurses that you look to um, that have a, a media presence, but that are, are creating a big impact? What would be some names? Ooh, I don't know if I can do names again. <laughs> <laughs> look at, the, look at some of the people I follow on LinkedIn. That's probably where it is. I, <laughs> I mean, everyone in this room, for sure. I mean, uh, Dr. James Simmons has been, uh, 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 when I met him at UCLA for the first time, he and I connected immediately. And uh, I've really learned about how he's shown up and, and, and how he's been a, a voice on national media as well for uh, organizations and patients on, on hot topics and how he framed them. Uh, even just... Uh, uh, hit, hit recording from uh, from his backyard about some of the hot topics related to COVID and other things. I mean, that honestly, that that really shaped how I thought about how things went. Um, you know, I look at uh, some of my mentors uh, like uh, Dr. Bernard Melnick and Dr. Grant and and a couple of uh, Tim Porter Grady and others who you know are on these national stages and and how they present themselves and how what their cadence of speaking is, how they have their talking points and how they. Um, they are, they're consistent as they move across. So those would be some of the ones that I've really kind of followed. And then, you know, I, I like I said, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn all the time. You know, some of the, the LinkedIn followers, Dr. Bonnie Clipper and others, um, I, I like to see how, how they've used that platform to be able to, you know, ask questions, get a little bit of engagement, test some ideas out, and then get, get the response and, and engage with a, a, a different audience um, in, on those platforms as well. Well, I appreciate you uh, letting me put you on the spot and put some of those names out there. It's so good for other people to hear and follow other nurses that are in the media to do exactly what you just said, see how they approach it. Because obviously we've got four completely different perspectives mm -hmm. here today. Uh, Dr. Weaver, thank you so much for joining us. Always a great pleasure speaking with you. Um, we will be in touch again too, I'm sure of it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jared. And, and you know, to the nurses out there, just go do it. I mean, honestly, it's it's not that hard. It's not that scary. You know, all you have to do is remember that when you're speaking and you say you're a nurse, you're representing the profession. And so show up like a professional, say your piece and represent us proud. And just really appreciate it, Jared. Love it. Thank you, Dan. Take care. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone, that uh, means that we are moving on to our, our last guest, uh, Dr. James Q. Simmons. Um, as I said before, so excited to, to have James on. Um, I, I feel like I'm going to be laughing during this uh, this panel, this conversation, because I just love the approach that James has. Uh, he's so uh, personal. So I, I am going to, James, introduce you just real quickly to just make sure, um, since uh, I think we just had a few difficulties last time, I want to make sure everyone knows exactly who you are uh, so we can start this conversation off right. Um, so uh, Dr. James Q. Simmons, as we get him pulled up here as a panelist, is a uh, board certified acute uh, care nurse practitioner, frontline healthcare provider during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, and passionate on-air medical contributor. Uh, Dr. James continues to emerge as one of the most sought after voices at the intersection of LGBTQIA+ plus and black communities. He is also the brains and heart behind the vibrant online community, Ask the MP, everything you're too scared to ask your MD. Uh, love it. Uh, he is also seen and heard on NBC, Fox, CBS, ABC, KTLA, Sirius XM, Yahoo, Loveline, Channel D, Dash Radio, and many more. Uh, and his combination of extensive multimedia experience and nearly 12 years of hospital-based critical care practice makes J Dr. James a go-to trusted source for real, relatable, uh, and reliable health information. Uh, James, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so excited for this conversation. Uh, thank you, you know, for having me. I'm, I, I feel I'm like, also very excited. <laughs> I feel like I need your Instagram video behind you right now. Uh, I, I'm missing that, <laughs> that touch, that feel. Um, so, you know, James, just as we're doing with, with all the panelists today, I want to start with your story. I think it's, it's especially uh, inspiring as well, giving the topics that you choose to focus on. Um, can you just give a little bit of that why you are you know, creating this media presence that you are and a little bit of the path of taking you from, you know, I didn't consider being a media person to whole, you know, I, here I am today. Sure. Um, and first of all, thank you, Jared and, and ANA California for having me and, um, putting up with my technical difficulties. I think that was all on my end before. I'm not sure. I'm so sorry about that. 
Um, so thank you for having me. And for, uh, you know, Alice and Dr. Ali and Dr. Dan before me, they were, they were fantastic uh, and learned so much. It also really highlighted to me how different all four of us are, right? So I hope the, uh, that everyone watching is going to get something really great from, from all four of us. Um, you know, I, I think my story could be an hour long. I will keep it to the, you know, 30 second, 60 second version. But my, unlike some of the other folks um, who we've heard from earlier, my actual degree, my uh, bachelor's degree is in broadcast journalism. So I was a trained news writer and then, so like a news producer and then some on camera stuff. Um, and that was a hundred trillion thousand years ago. And I, Thought that that was a fantastic profession. I actually started off in radio. And so I did a little bit of on-air work on the radio, lots of promotion stuff. Um, and then I sort of realized like, I am a gay black man in the middle of Iowa in 1990, whatever. This isn't working out too great. I need to get out of here. Well, you don't really jump from, it's sort of like being a brand new nurse and then being like, I'm gonna be the charge nurse in the ICU tomorrow. Like you don't really jump to you know, a market like Chicago or San Francisco or Atlanta or New York, which is where I was trying to move. Um, so I turned that from a broadcasting sort of profession into like marketing and PR. And I had a fantastic marketing and PR uh, career in Chicago. But that entire time I had this little voice in the back of my head I was like, you want to be a nurse. Like you've always wanted to be a nurse. You, you, you want to be in this profession. My mom was a pediatric ICU nurse before she went, she actually went into the ministry. So I grew up a nurse's kid and a pastor's kid, you know, which is probably why I'm so crazy. But <laughs> you know, the, uh, this whole time it was like, you want to be a nurse. And so after 10 years of that great career in Chicago, you know, I decided, all right, I've been taking some of these prerequisites periodically, just out of curiosity, just to stay on top of things. I'm going to do this. I don't want to look back. So I stopped a fantastic corporate PR marketing job. They were fast tracking me, you know, to the big leagues in that job, but I quit it. And I went back to one of those sort of blended, um, you know, uh, master's programs, NP programs for folks who don't have a degree, uh, a bachelor's degree in nursing. And I went to UIC, University of Illinois, Chicago, which is a fantastic place. Um, and they taught me everything, right? Taught me how to be a nurse. And then they required me to go be a bedside nurse, which I think was a fantastic idea as an acute care nurse practitioner. Um, and then, you know, years, three, four years later, I finished, became an acute care nurse practitioner. And then realized I sort of missed doing media. <laughs> I sort of missed writing. I sort of missed being on camera. I missed talking on the radio. I was like, wait a minute. I love this nursing thing a lot. Like, I'm really glad I did it, but also like, I kind of miss my media thing. Well, fast, you know, drum roll, 2011, 12, 13 in there. Everyone's trying to do their thing on this YouTube. I don't know if you've heard of it. <laughs> and uh, I was like, well, I can do some videos on YouTube. This will be great. And I want to talk to people. I want to talk, you know, we all know as nurses, by the way, congratulations to us, 20 years is the most uh, trusted profession, right? Our friends and family come to us and they're like, I have this thing on my, you know what, like, uh, what is that, right? And I was getting those questions all the time and I was like, okay, if I'm getting these from my friends and family and coworkers and, and you know, the, the guy mowing the lawn at the library, like whatever, I'm getting these questions from all these people. There's going to be people who want, who need these answers on a place like YouTube. So I started putting out videos on YouTube and they were kind of like uh, Dan was just talking about his first season of the podcast, which was not as bad as you think it was, Dan, um, was, I mean, my videos were horrible, Jared. They were just awful. I was like this close to the camera and I was, you know, just like, they were too fast and they weren't edited and there was some weird background or whatever. But lo and behold, people kind of took to them because I was sort of talking about things that a lot of other medical professionals hadn't talked about. And I was doing it in a way, as you can kind of tell, my style is a lot different than a lot of folks. So yeah. I was kind of doing it in this way. And I was like, all right, your, your poop screen, <laughs> this is a thing. Like, let's talk about why that might be serious and why you should get it checked out. Let's talk about why it might be because you drank some wine and ate a salad last night for dinner, like, you know, and, and everything in between. And so that sort of energy kind of took off. And that was, like I said, a 12, 2012, 2013, something like that. A couple of those videos went viral for the time. Mm -hmm. Their accounts now probably wouldn't be considered as viral, but for the time they kind of went really big. And I was like, all right, maybe I'm onto something here. Mm -hmm. And it has kind of turned into from there sort of the, the media beast that it is right now. Yeah. It's such a 
fantastic story. I, I actually feel like I did not know the piece about you having uh, your bachelor's in, in broadcast journalism before, which now <laughs> when I see you on camera, now it, it totally makes sense. And I know we're going to get to some of the on-camera stuff uh, today, a little skill building around that. Uh, but now putting that, those two pieces together, it, uh, it makes so much sense. So it, it, I think, is the perfect because it, it creates a new perspective with you leading into media as compared to, say, some of our other panelists or just other nurses that are attending today where nursing is their first profession uh, and, and maybe this media piece is, is sort of the second or hobby or, you know, uh, side gig or something like that. With you approaching it the second time, obviously you had a lot of previous knowledge. Now, okay, here's what I should do. Here's what I maybe I shouldn't do. But what did you think about then having that prior knowledge and starting that sort of, you know, nurse medical, uh, or I shouldn't say medical advice, excuse me, um, but uh, just advice through social media? Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's tough, right? That's right there. You said it. Like, we have to be very clear. This is not medical advice. Right. Um, you know, I, I think there were a couple of things. You know, I, I was a trained... I'm getting my broadcaster desk set up here. I was a trained, you know, broadcast journalism. So, you know, thank you for watching this week's edition of the news. You know, I am James Simmons reporting live from what people are not engaging with that necessarily anymore. It depends on us. And so I think, and I bring that word up very intentionally. I think different from some of the other panelists here, um, my audience is, is not and wasn't designed at the beginning to be nurses. My audience was everyone who does not have any sort of medical nursing, health related training at all. Um, it, as an extension of being a nurse is, is why I sort of went with that focus. And so, you know, I, I thought it was great bringing in my sort of journalistic chops from the beginning, my ability to write and present, and then being able to blow all of that up <laughs> on social media because people don't really respond to that as much on social media, right? And so I have those skills and abilities when I'm speaking, when I'm on whatever national cable platform lately for the last two years, talking about obviously COVID. Um, but even, you know, I'm a, I'm a CDC ambassador for the, H uh, for the CDC's Let's Stop HIV Together campaigns. And so I do a lot of media work around that. Sometimes that requires a level of professionalism and being able to handle some questions that they did not prepare you for, like Alice was talking about before. Um, it can be really interesting. While at the same time, understanding that like the video I did this morning, I literally was laying down in bed. <laughs> <laughs> like sometimes you, do, but people like that. They want you to be real. They want you to be approachable. And so I think it's being able to find that balance. And it's something that I've worked on over time to be doctorally prepared, you know, James Simmons with all of these credentials and letters behind my name and blah, blah, blah. While also being able to be like, yep, I don't have a stitch of makeup on. I'm laying in bed. I think that we need to talk about, you know, yesterday was like, let's donate blood. Like I was literally on my way out to running out to work. That video got shared 128 times yesterday. Yeah. And I, I think it's just like, hey, y'all have the day off. Like maybe we should go, you know, donate some blood because we're out of it. And, and talking to people as if you're having a conversation, a casual conversation with them at dinner is what translates on social media. And I feel so lucky to be able to sort of balance those two types of conversations. You know, I think one of the, this is one of my favorite posts that you did uh, recently, and I think it helps highlight exactly what you're talking about now is you did a post recently or just a couple of weeks ago about domestic abuse mm -hmm. uh, and your post and what you were saying had nothing to do with domestic abuse at all. Uh, and you found this very um, uh, clever and personable way to communicate that hidden message while talking about something that was completely different. I think you're talking about healthy eating and, you know, During don't eat your Super hot Bowl. dog, it's yeah. Friday or, you know, something like that. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and so I, that just resonated so much with me because it is the thought behind how you deliver the message to that particular audience that you're, you're looking for and making sure it was in a, a, an approachable way as possible because given the topic, domestic abuse, right? This, you never know who might be in the room. Um, so I just thought that was such a fantastic way to sort of set up the, the differences in, in social media profiles and how you approach versus maybe uh, other people might approach media and social media.
Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I think you you said the word a couple of times there too. And if I can sort of have anyone, you know, any nurse, professional, anyone, wherever you are in your career, we're all professionals, right? The profession of nursing. I love to pe remind people of that um, because of the imposter syndrome that we get as nurses. I have, I have lots of opinions about that. I get it myself, but remember we are a profession. You know, I think that you said the word, Jared, audience several times. And if you are always keeping your audience at the center of everything you are doing in media and social media, you will never go wrong. You might not get it totally right every time, but you'll never go wrong. And so that message was not about getting more social media followers. That message was not about that video being shared. That video was shared like a thousand times. I think it was my most shared video I've done on Instagram maybe ever. Um, I, I didn't intend for it to be, but you know, I, I looked into, to Alice's point, you know, okay, there's been some narratives about whether domestic violence really is, uh, really does increase on days like the Super Bowl. And, you know, I looked at the data, I went to the research, I still have my UCLA library login, right? I do, mm -hmm. I'm there constantly. Um, I looked at the data, I looked at the research, there is some, you know, validity behind the fact that maybe incidents, you know, of domestic violence do increase on days like the Super Bowl. Either way, Regardless, we always need to be talking about this, right? So I took that as an opportunity with my audience first and thinking about if someone just happened scrolling through Instagram and is themselves in a situation, what's the way to communicate information for them to be able to get help if they're ready for it while keeping them safe? Yeah. And you certainly can't have a video. Let's say that person is required to have their phone on speakerphone for whatever reason, you can't be like, hey, if you're in trouble and you need help from domestic violence, call this number, right? Like that you right. can't do that. And so because I kept my audience first, I just was like, yeah, here's how to not eat the entire plate of dip during the Super Bowl. But like you said, the entire time across the bottom, I'm like, this has nothing to do with this. If you need help, you know, if you're in a situation, here's some resources for you. And because I kept my audience, the, the focus of what I was doing, I think that's why that video and others have, have translated so well for people. We didn't intentionally plan this today for all four panelists to say the same thing, which is audience first, value first, you know, <laughs> everything else will come after that. But I'm so happy that it's happened because it couldn't, it couldn't be more true. And, and I think that's why, or, or uh, maybe contributing part to success of you and, and other panelists here is because you really do have that audience forward. Um, and so you're, you're right, you're not gonna be in the wrong, right? Uh, so this is a great, we we're talking about domestic violence. So it's such a sensitive um, uh, uh, topic. Let's talk about more sensitive topics and, and essentially <laughs> how do we Great, Talk thanks, about, Jared. <laughs> yeah, you get the juiciest, hardest, you know, question that I think every nurse right. is is really wanting an answer to. Alice touched upon it, I think, briefly in, in, in the lead up here, but I, I knew this question would be fantastic for you because you talk about gender issues, you talk about racism, you talk about so many hard hitting issues that are are sensitive for people in many ways. Um, brings up emotions very quickly, so. What I would like to focus on for this, you know, sort of broad question is how do you balance your duty as a nurse with the responsibilities you have to your employer or other audiences that you are responsible to, to speak to or, or respond to? How do you balance that and, and talk about these very hard issues to talk about? So this, this webinar goes until tomorrow, right? Yeah, we yeah. have we have that <laughs> yeah, much time because we, we, okay, yeah. <laughs> we have we need all that time, right? Wow, uh, it's a lot, and I will you know promise the audience because you are first, of course, that I we I will not be able to give you a lovely, perfect, tidy little answer on how you do that, particularly in the time constraints that we have now. Um, I, I will also say that you know I, in the spirit of full disclosure, which is a I think how you do it the best. You're always sort of completely brutally honest. Um, representing yourself. I, I, generally speaking, throughout most of my time on social media, give or take a year or two here and there, I have been uh, independently employed. Um, so I haven't always necessarily worked for a hospital system. 
Um, I were, you know, as a nurse practitioner in the state of California, you know, there's some kind of gray area rules about being able to be a 1099 employee versus a W-2 and all those different things. So um, I haven't always necessarily been beholden to a larger healthcare system, if you will. Um, so that has sometimes made things uh, easier. I think, you know, getting to brass tacks and specifics, I think it is always really important to, to highlight that you're speaking on behalf of yourself. And I have a nice little, you'll see on almost all of my posts, I have this really lovely disclaimer that is like, this is me, it's not medical advice. Don't hate on people in the comments. If you act a fool, I will delete your comments and report you to me. Like, uh, but I think even saying it in ways like that, if you come on my page and act a fool, I'm kicking you off. Like people respond to that. Um, so it's more about being yourself about it than actually, you know, feeling, feeling nervous. I, I will say that, oh, you know, I think Dan is, is a perfect, like, perfect example. Dr. Ali is a perfect example of when you have a really crucial role within an organization, which we all are, when you work for that organization, you are responsible for the, the rules that they put out, you know, for, for what, what you can and cannot do. That being said, they also, you would be on social media otherwise. Right. And I think that we as nurses in the profession of nursing don't necessarily need to be treated differently than any other individual on social media in any other profession other than patient privacy. Right. Mm -hmm. So I very vaguely, and I don't, I as a practice don't really do this much anymore, but in the past, I have very vaguely sort of talked about maybe a patient scenario. Oh, this patient was in a car accident and they, you know, had a, unfortunately, they came in with a partial amputation. That's my, maybe the deepest I'll go, right? I won't tell you when, I won't tell you, you know, anything else about this patient because I think that that's where we start to get into gray areas. But I will say at the same time, I think it's important to not be afraid. Um, we have such an important and powerful voice, not only in our just volume of who we are as nurses in the healthcare profession, not only in that great, you know, survey that comes out every January about how trusted we are or not, you know, 20 years in a row, but we are trained professionals. We have been the ones on the front line uh, of COVID, on the front line of everything, yeah. you know, since Florence and, and probably even before that in certain different types of capacities. Our voice is really valuable. Our experiences are really valuable. And to me, I think that is more important than being afraid of your organization saying that you can or cannot do something on social media. You get to do whatever you want as a private citizen on social media. As a nurse, you need to respect those rules. But I think the most important thing is if you are keeping your audience focused, I mean, there are hundreds of nurses out there with way more followers than I have, way more impact, but they're doing it in different ways. They're talking about health, wellness, they're talking about fashion. Maybe sometimes they're trying to educate folks like I do, whatever your, your thing is, you can do it. And nurses have figured out how to do it in a way that protects their jobs and their livelihood if you work for an organization and by using your own voice. And I think that that voice is only gonna get bigger. It's only gonna get better. It's only gonna get more powerful as nurses. So I, I will tell you, don't be afraid. Definitely be yourself. Just know that like, ain't nobody playing with you when it comes to patient privacy, like don't even go there. Just like, don't do it. And then otherwise, like you're good. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that because I know that is probably one of the most asked questions or biggest concerns that nurses have. Um, and, and I think those are very valid uh, insights. If you if focus on on the issue and, and less on maybe what is what you're attached to or your responsibilities, you find yourself in a safer place, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I wonder now, and because we're kind of talking about these sensitive topics, how you take your information that you produce out as content and say uh, how you talk about the sensitive topics in your Instagram profile uh, and how do you make it digestible compared to, let's say, your radio segments as, as a host on XM or um, iHeartRadio, I et cetera. Do you have a different process for how you want to frame and, and make the content digestible? Is it relatively the same? Sort of what is the process behind you setting yourself up to talk about these sensitive topics? I think Alice really touched on this before. So if those of y'all who were, uh, who got to see Alice, um, I, I learned a lot of this from Alice, uh, particularly as I moved into doing 
uh, tele like local television and national media, you know, national television, because so much of what I'd done had been social media. And then my, you know, however many years ago of training of broadcast journalism. Well, even now in media, like in television, they don't want you to be as dry and boring as that, right? Like at, at the end of the day, it's important to remember that television is a business and they need people to watch so that they can sell their airtime to advertisers, right? Even news outlets, even news outlets that are trying their best to just cover the news and have you on as an expert for that. At the end of the day, you need to be engaging to an audience, right? You, you need to sort of learn how to speak to an audience, something I'm not doing very well in this present moment, but you need to learn how to say, know what you're gonna say. And that preparation comes from being really confident in the, the data being really confident in the, the information that you have. And so I spend a fair amount of time, more than people probably realize before, you know, I think the most recent one I did was Yahoo News um, or Yahoo Finance, and that's live. And those Yahoo Finance anchors, I know them, I love them, but sometimes they like to, you know, throw in a little question there that they didn't prepare me for. So like Alice said, you know, if you're, if you're doing that sort of level of media, um, even local radio, generally you've worked with a producer, they, you have outlines back and forth together via email or text, whatever the types of the questions that you're going to go over or what they want you to be prepared for. Then I go and look at the data and sometimes the headlines, sometimes the other news organizations, but then I actually really look at the data. You know, if this, I do a lot on KTLA and they love to do new research. This new pill is going to make you lose a thousand pounds by next week, right? Like, you know, researchers in Sweden have found the cure for like baldness. <laughs> please give it to me so i'll go read okay let me actually read this study right i think this is a perfect example i was asked by a news organization to comment on that i'm going here we're going controversial see jared I'm, I'm bringing it all in for you so this this news organization national news platform asked me the other day if i would come on and comment about the research study that showed that covid lockdowns did nothing to stem the uh, uh spread of covid right and I was like, huh, that seems a little bit interesting because I've read maybe 12 other pieces of research that say that more or less lockdowns did have some role in slowing or stopping the spread of COVID depending on the community and the country and how they were enforced, all that kind of stuff. So that's interesting. That's the first I've heard of this. So instead of just reading a CNN article about it or the New York Times or wherever you get your, your news from, I actually went and read the research, read the data. And the first thing I noticed was that this was not done by healthcare professionals. It was done by four economists, three of whom are employed by national governments who did not enforce government, uh, nationwide lockdowns. Okay. So we have some bias in this research already, right? Like had I not done that, I would not have been prepared to talk to this national media outlet about like, first of all, like you need to check your sources, right? Like where is this information coming from and their biases? I then went on to actually read their research and look at what they had. They so were taking some of the same, number, same numbers that other research studies had done about COVID lockdowns and completely what I thought as a doctorally prepared nurse, misinterpreting the data. Mm -hmm. So I said, I have not had time to comb through all of this data, but they did use the same data that about 12 other researchers did and they came to a completely different conclusion. So while we may never know the answer to this, I would be suspect of an organization that are all economists, three of them employed by governments who, that did not encourage uh, mandatory lockdowns, that came to one specific different conclusion than 12 other people who looked at the same data. I would be suspect of that. And these news organizations, they loved it. They were like, oh my God, we never thought about that. What a great thing, right? Well, that was me taking my time and effort before going on a national news platform. I do something pretty similar before I go on social media. Believe it or not, you know, I took time to research that domestic, the domestic violence statistics. I took time to look at the data. Do they actually go up on the Super Bowl or not? I actually really took time to do that. But then what you saw was me acting crazy on an Instagram reel with a bunch of, you know, words going across the bottom. So I think the responsibility of us as nursing professionals lies in making sure that you you have your stuff together, that you know what you're talking about as a nurse, particularly if your audience is non-healthcare people that you're trying to educate about a healthcare topic, it is our responsibility to get that right or as right as we can. And whether you're, I do stuff in a, in, from my pool with a caftan on and a hat holding a cocktail, but I'm giving you valuable information. It is, a, is, it, it is as important to me in those instances to do my research and make sure it's right versus when I'm on a national media platform. 
You know, uh, uh, man, I feel like the segues, and I've been saying segue all way all day today. I feel like I need a new term for that. But you just brought up a, a great point. Somebody, uh, uh, Jacqueline from the audience, is actually asking this question, and you just talked about how you can be on your your back deck by your pool in a tank top, um, you know, uh, giving important information, or you can be that you know the the person in, in in front of a camera. And you can have both. Their question was. Um, really related to how do I set myself up as a credible person, right? But they asked, mm. do I, they asked the question, and do I need a certain degree? Do I need to be doctorally prepared or a master's to feel like I can be a person that can be a source to media? And obviously, or maybe not, obviously, we know internally that that is, that is not the case. But I guess what I'd like to ask from you is sort of, how do you present yourself to say you don't have those special letters behind or in front of your your name? How can you make sure you present yourself as a valid and credible source to news so that way they can see you as such? I think uh, knowing what you want to want to do out of your media career and where you want it to go is, is really, really important. I did not have news organizations sort of in my you know, three to five year plan for a while. And then I did, I started thinking like, I, I kind of want to do this on the news. I want to be one of those stupid talking heads because I think I can do it better. Also, where are the queer black talking heads talking about lots of things, let alone like health and things that are really important. I want to do that. And I want to represent my communities doing that. So I think knowing where you want to go with it is really important. Um, yeah, this imposter syndrome is with us nurses is big time, right? I feel like even as sort of like, you look at this patriarchal, you, uh, you know, structures and the hierarchical structures that we live in. And it was not long ago where, you know, not long ago at all, people probably watching this, you know, are, were taught, like you literally are not, you don't get to be an autonomous thinker as a nurse. Your job is to just be at the beck and call of a physician of an MD or DO. That's still in our blood. It's still in our DNA. And so why would we not think that we couldn't, do media because, well, no one's allowing us to, no one's giving us the, you know, giving me an order so that then I can go talk to CNN. Like that's how our, that's how we're trained. And so of course that translates into, you know, what, what's happening in media. I, I think that working through that imposter syndrome and really realizing that we are an autonomous profession, how we practice is not always in autonomous, but we are an autonomous profession and being a nurse is enough. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you. A lot more people have come knocking on my door, asking me to talk, asking me to give speeches, asking my opinion about things since I've become Dr. James Simmons. But I always make sure that they include that I'm Dr. James Simmons, hospitalist nurse practitioner, always, because I'm very, very proud to be a nurse. And I'm very proud of our profession. And I want what I do to help elevate everyone, right? Rising tide lifts all boats. If if we have more nurses like Alice and Dr. Ali and Dan and myself and whatever out there doing this, it's going to create more opportunities for nurses. And I can't tell you how many times I've had producers of TV shows, radio, whatever, say, man, it's so much more fun to talk to you. It's so much better. I feel like I learned more. And some of this is me legitimately following in the footsteps of people like Alice who have been out there really, you know, blazing those trails. And I feel like I'm coming in like with, with a, a fresh perspective on it as yeah. well. So I think knowing that you as a nurse are qualified, you have gone through those schooling, you have taken the tests, you have that experience, you still need to know what you're talking about, right? You still need to do the research, you still need to have the data, but know that start, like Alice, I think Alice's story is fantastic. You know, she was at a, just doing a blood pressure screening, right? And I think the American Heart Association was like, hey, can you do this? And the next thing you know, she's like, nurse Alice Benjamin. So start small, right? Your first TV opportunity is not going to be like an international hit on CNN. Like that's not going to happen. And maybe you don't want to do news. Maybe you want to be a beauty influencer or whatever. Well, you can't be a beauty influencer unless you kind of know what you're talking about with beauty. So know that as a nurse, you do have that foundation. You do have the credibility. You do have the, the ability to do this, but you still have to learn. It's just like being a specialist. So like I think that midwives and like l and nurses that scares the ever-loving crap out of me yes we're all nurses but like you do not want me catching babies like i don't know i love it i'm so totally fascinated by it i think it's amazing but it's a specialty 
And those people have learned and trained and gotten really good at it and had some experience. So, but they did that with the foundation of nursing. So all I'm saying is you have a foundation of nursing, you can do this media thing. You just gotta kind of gotta work at it a little bit and not be scared. Reach out to your local newspaper, reach out to a blog that you like to read, you know, and say, hey, let me write a piece for you, or just do a couple of videos, tag some producers in them, see what they think. Like start off with your local AM radio station, you know, cut your chops there, or your friends, girlfriends, brothers, sisters, dog, hairdressers, podcast, right? Hey, let me come on and talk about COVID for five minutes. You'll you'll start to learn and you'll exercise your chops and then you'll realize A, if you like it, and B, like, oh, I think I could be pretty good at this. Let me learn some more. And 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 that's that's kind of how I would recommend that path. That's, uh, that's fantastic. I mean, so many great uh, suggestions there. I'm, I'm looking at the time here and I'm like, man, how did 30 minutes already fly by so fast? But I wanted to make are sure we that done? we covered oh gosh, we one are. of our, we should have just booked you all for an hour each. That's really what we should have done next time, next year, right? Um, but there is one set of questions I do want to make sure that we talk about because it hasn't been talked about yet. I think it's uh, something that kind of is just swept under the rug and people learn these skills later. And, and a lot of it is what you do so well, which is on camera sort of 101. So I'm, I'm hoping with maybe just in these next two or three minutes, some of those things that you learn from your experience as well as your Instagram account on camera tips that can help nurses be more presentable as in better lighting Jared Fessler the next time you host a nurses and media day as one of <laughs> the on okay. camera tips, right? You could be looking like <laughs> Dr. Simmons here um, glowing. So uh, please, if you could just di divest a little. Thank you for saying that I'm glowing. Um, also, so I'll say listening. I don't know if y'all caught there. Jared was like, in the next two to three minutes, X, Y, and Z. What he's saying is I can be long-winded. I could probably talk about this for 10 minutes, but he's like, I got to shut this webinar down in two minutes. Listening, I think is the biggest key. You can't have predetermined in your mind exactly what you want to say. To Dan's point earlier, you might have an idea maybe as an organization or on the topic, sort of a message you want to get across. And I think that's really important. You kind of have to know, you can't just go into something blindly, right? I, that, to my example earlier, I wanted to make sure that people knew that you, just because someone says somebody did research on a topic and then we just blindly trust it. My underlying theme was like, do your research on the research, right? About those economists putting out this research about COVID lockdowns. Other than that, the most important thing when you are on camera, you are on the radio, is listening. So in, in instances like this, Jared said um, things about, he used the word divulge, he used, we have two to three minutes, he said that I was glowing, he talked about his lighting, like I listened to all of that, not thinking about, oh gosh, I have to remember to say this thing next. So listening, you know, one of, uh, I was, did some media training um, with a woman named Marky Costello, who's fantastic here in Los Angeles. She taught me this thing that has saved me so many times. You just piggyback off of the last word someone said. So I think the last word you said, uh, Jared, was divulge. If you don't know what the hell, heck you're going to say, I almost slipped there. If you don't know what the heck you're going to say next, just say their last word and piggyback off of it. Divulge. Well, Jared, I really do want to divulge to you, you know, how important I think it is to have good lighting, right? Like you just go from there. It's literally easy things like that. I also will admit that I need some time to get my stuff set up. So I had my lighting set up here. I knew I wanted to wear my orange sweater. I made sure my AirPods were um, uh, charged up. I had the Logitech camera where I wanted it. The windows are in a perfect place for me to get lighting. I made sure I had all of that set up way in advance mm -hmm. because for me, that's really important. And if technical issues come up on something, it can really throw my brain off. Um, so make sure you got your tech set, set up you know, piggyback off of the last word that someone gives you if you want. Lighting and sound are always super important. Interestingly, sound more than uh, than visual, I will say. Um, and then, you know, listen to the person you're having a conversation with. And most importantly, just be yourself. Don't try to be me. Alice and I have both done a lot of local TV in Los Angeles. We both are very, very good at it. We have very different styles. It doesn't mean Alice's style is better or worse than mine. Mine's better or worse than hers. They, it, we just have different styles and people appreciate that. So just know that it's okay for you to be yourself. 
Absolutely wonderful. James, I knew this conversation was going to be fantastic. I knew it was going to be too short. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much for coming on today and, and sharing some of your wisdom and insights with, with our nurses today. And uh, we're very much looking forward to doing another one like this in the future. Thank you so much for having me, Jared. Really appreciate it. Thanks y'all for listening too. Have a great day. Thanks. So with that, I believe that's the end to our first ever Nurses in Media Day. Uh, I love this event. I'm very looking forward to um, speaking with you all. If you have additional questions after this, please send them to my email. I'll put it here into the chat. Um, otherwise, um, connect with ANA California on our social media profiles, connect with Dr. James Q. Simmons, Dr. Ali Talib, Dr. Dan Weberg, and Miss Alice Benjamin, and we will catch you all next time. Thank you so much.